The scripture commands us to accept one another just as God in Christ also has accepted us. Well, I don't know about you, but I have a few people in my life that are pretty hard to accept. What's the solution? How do you do that? That's today on Living on the Edge. Stay with me. Welcome to this February 11th edition of Living on the Edge with Chip Ingram. I'm Katie Kennard. You know, I'm guessing you're right there with Chip. I know I am. It's hard to love people the way we should. We're in the process of learning eight different principles for how to build great relationships. So if you missed any, let me encourage you to back up and listen to those first. Now, here's Chip with principle number five. Now I want to give you the fifth principle, at least of all the things I've learned over the years about making relationships work is this. Knowing God as He is is the prerequisite for loving others as they are. Knowing not what you think God is like, but actually knowing, encountering God as He really is, is the prerequisite to loving other people as they are. In fact, there's a couple principles built in that if you think about it, and what you realize is, well, wait a second. That means the premise is the goal is actually to love people as they are. You mean I'm not supposed to fix them first? You mean the goal is not to get everybody lined up and acting and behaving in ways that make me happy and make my life work? That I'm actually just supposed to be an instrument and I love them as they are? That doesn't mean I approve of their behavior. That doesn't mean I always like it. It doesn't mean I just say that attitude doesn't matter. But I am going to love them exactly the way God loves me. See, it's the kindness of the Lord that leads to repentance. When God wanted to fix the human race after the coup, he didn't come in and try and put external restraints. Let's see, I'll make him do this and I'll make him do that and this happens. Romans 12, 2 says, it is the kindness of the Lord. It is the goodness of the Lord. It's God's grace, his unconditional love that sometimes brings consequences to behavior. But the motivation ever when you see God for who he is is a heart of acceptance, a heart of love, a heart of goodness, a heart of desire to bring people to himself so they can enjoy the highest and the best and the deepest relationship possible. And believe it or not, bringing about change in a relationship is not about fixing people. It's learning how to love them as they are. And see, you know what? Some of the behaviors might look the same as a parent. You provide some consequences. But you know, it's a lot different being inwardly angry at one of your kids and sick and tired of that behavior, and I'm going to fix them, and if they do that, I'm going to do this, and we're going to get this straightened out or punishing a mate because of their lack of attention or lack of responsiveness. It's a lot different than saying, you know, I really love this person and that behavior, that attitude I need to address, but I'm gonna address it with tenderness around this person's heart and what I want them to feel and know down deep in their soul, even when I have to have love that is not very pleasant for them to experience, I want them to know that I'm for them and that I care about them and I want to pass on this unconditional grace and goodness and acceptance that God's given to me. But see, as we learned last time, you can't impart what you don't possess. And so knowing God as he is is the prerequisite to loving others as they are. And when you love others as they are, the way God loves you, can I tell you something amazing? Repentance occurs. You you know what the literal meaning of the word repentance? Metanoia, change of the mind. It means people have a change of mind. They think differently about God after that. They think differently about you. They think differently about themselves. The disciples um, had a big problem with seeing God for who he is. We all do, but every culture has kind of false views of God that send people down religious trails that often are not like God at all. And as you study the New Testament and you walk, you know, in the sandals of those disciples and, you know, you observe how they think about Jesus and the questions they ask, it's interesting, I can only find one thing they ever asked Jesus to teach them in the New Testament. It's how to pray. I mean, you would think they would say, Lord, would you teach us how to preach? Or could you teach us how to bring fire down from the sky? Or, you know, we want to be hot shots and everything. And Lord, 
Teach us to pray. Why? They grew up in a religious system as little Jewish boys in the synagogue where they, they knew reams and reams by memory of the Old Testament. They grew up in a system where a very high official would wear ornate robes and have all these passages and would go on the street corner and say word after word after word of long prayers citing multiple passages and they thought that was spiritual. And then they, they walked around with Jesus. And when he was praying, it was like it was a real person and it wasn't like he was trying to twist God's arm to get God to do something. And, there wasn't an ought to or a got to, but when they were around Jesus, there was a sense of, of life and intimacy, and he is experiencing something that we've never seen before. And so in Luke chapter 11, they actually, as you get the idea from the text, they're listening to him finishing up his prayers, and then one of them kind of raises his hand and says, Lord, would you, would you teach us to pray? And all they know is the forms. They were taught all these religious forms. And they said, you know, the Pharisees, they have religious forms. There's a prayer you say in the morning. There's a prayer you say in the evening. There's this kind of prayer for this situation. And you wrote, memorized those. And John the Baptist, he taught his guys some forms. So Jesus, will you give us a formula? Will you tell us what are the right words to say and how to say it? You pick up the story in Luke 11. Why don't you open your Bibles there if, you, if you're not there already. And in verse 1, it says that it came about while he was praying in a certain place, after he had finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray just as John also taught his disciples. And so Jesus, understanding their mindset, what, he, what you're going to see is he'll give them a formula. And it's the right formula. It's the right pattern of prayer. And he doesn't say just even pray this way. He says, say these words. So here's the formula. But what he's going to do after he gives them the formula, what we call the Lord's Prayer, is then he's going to give them a uh, negative example, and then the truth of how to really pray and why, and then he's going to give them a positive example, and he's going to take the negative example and the positive example sandwiched in between this command about how to relate to God. But all he's really going to share is the problem is not with your form. The problem's not how long you pray. The problem isn't so much the actual words. He's going to teach him, your problem is you don't see the Father for what he's like. You think the Father is hard to please. You think God is angry with you most of the time. You think his arms are crossed and toe tapping and he has a bony finger saying, yeah, hey, you should have been praying longer. And why are you here now? And why are you asking for this? Because last week you did that. And what Jesus is going to teach him is the problem in their prayers is not a formula. He's going to teach them they need to see the Father completely differently. And I would suggest that the way the disciples loved people as they were was because they learned to see the Father as he is. Let, let's pick up the formula. I'm not going to spend a lot of time here because uh, you've heard it many times, but let's just, the overview. So he says to them, when you pray, say, Father, hallowed be thy name. But, but he turns the tables already. Wait a second, Father? It's the Aramaic word Abba. It's, it's the word of a two or three year old boy who would, who would tug on his daddy's robe to say, will you pick me up? Abba, intimacy. Their view of God was he's transcendent. He's powerful. He's the God who split the Red Sea. But they missed his intimacy. And the first thing Jesus says is when you see him, he's an available, loving Abba, Father. And the balance is, and holy is his name. He is the God who filled the temple of Isaiah. Holy, holy, holy. But he's transcendent, but he's approachable and intimate like your own dad. Then he goes on to say to them, uh, thy kingdom come. And then in another gospel, your will be done. When you pray, come to God knowing he's an intimate father and come with great reverence and then get his agenda on the table first before you get yours. God, I want your will to get done. I want your rulership and the way you want life to occur in the world that I'm in. And then make sure you pray for your specific needs. It's, it's not bad or unspiritual. Give us this day our daily bread. God, I've got needs. I've got material needs. I've got relational needs. I've got financial needs. I've got work needs. He says, you bring those to him. And then notice he says, but understanding there's this relationship as you bring your needs between your relationship with others and your relationship with the Father. So he goes on to say, and forgive us our sins as we ourselves forgive everyone who is indebted to us. 
Don't think that you can have this little silo of disconnected relationship with God as you have hate and unforgiveness in your heart toward others. That's why intimate praying with the Father is always a cleansing experience. It always forces us to do a little evaluation of where is my heart with other people? Because I've got to get this right before God says we can make that right. And then he says it's a hostile world. It's a fallen world. There is an enemy. And this enemy wants to literally destroy your soul and destroy your marriage and destroy your life. And so ask specifically, lead us not into temptation. And as the other gospels will writers will say, but deliver us from evil. And literally it's from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory. And so he, he tells them, come to God. It's intimate and yet he's holy. Get his agenda on the table. Ask specifically for your needs. Then deal with any relational issues of unforgiveness so you can appropriate that. Ask for his protection. And then now notice what he does. He just, he tells a story. Lord, teach us to pray. Story. Negative example. Truth. Positive example. By the way, often Judaism teaching, he would do that. They would couch two things and in the middle was the core truth. Let's pick up the story. He goes on to say to them, suppose one of you have a friend and you go out to him at midnight and you say to him, friend, lend me three loaves. The idea, three loaves of bread. For a friend of mine has come to me on a journey and I have nothing to set before him. And from inside the house, he shall answer and say, do not bother me. The door has already been shut and my children and I are in bed. I cannot get up and give you anything. Very common situation. And historically and culturally, you need to understand, when someone would come from out of town, hospitality is not like we think of it today. Like, you know, I'd really like to put you up for the night, but we're really busy, and, you know, the kids are already in bed, and, you know, maybe there's a Motel 6 or something you could get, sorry. No, 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 no. There was an absolute obligation in this culture when someone came to stay with you, you had to provide for them. So this is not like there's a plan B. This is like you know, I got a problem. I need to put these people up, but I don't have any food. And so he goes to a friend and he says, hey, will you give me three loaves? And the friend goes, hey, I'm in bed, forget it. Notice how then Jesus develops the story. I tell you, even though, verse 8, he will not get up and give him anything because he is his friend, yet because of his persistence, he will get up and give him as much as he needs. Will you underline the word persistence in your Bible? Literally, the word is shamelessness or without shame. It's used in multiple places in the New Testament and has the idea without shame or boldness, and it can be mean persistence, or it can mean just literally without shame, which I think I'll explain in a minute is the very clear meaning of this text. Before we dig in, let's, let's jump to, then what's he going to say? I tell you, he won't get up because of it, because of your shamelessness. And then verse 9, and I say to you, here's the application, ask and you will receive... Seek, and you shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives. Here, here, here's what prayer is all about. And he who seeks finds, and the one who knocks, it'll be open. This is real simple, guys. You ask, you're going to receive. You seek, you're going to find. You knock, it'll be open. This is just clear cut. Then notice he tells another story. He goes on to say, now suppose one of your fathers is asked by his son for a fish. He will not give him a snake instead of the fish, will he? Or if he asks for an egg, he won't give him a scorpion, will he? And then here's the clincher. If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask? Now, you're saying to yourself, maybe, Chip, where are you getting this that they have a wrong view of God? Uh, I remember the uh, very first pastorate I was in, I was there maybe nine months, year, year and a half at the most. Uh, didn't know this fellow very well. I came in from out of town and we had this really uh, old car and we really upgraded to this little tiny Subaru wagon that I could get all my kids in. And I came in out of town and it's when it starts to rain and it hasn't rained for a long time, the oil from the pavement and the dust. And I mean, it is just like ice like this. And so I'm coming out of Dallas and there's one of those big loops and that is going to send me on the freeway toward my house. And, I, you know, everyone is careful. It's real slick. And so everyone's going like 12, 15 miles an hour. And then in front of me, there's this bus that just starts swimming around like this and hits it into a car. And it's like being in a movie in slow motion. It's coming, it's coming. So I 
I've hit the brake a little bit and that doesn't work. So he hits me and I go into the guardrail. Then I'm spinning around in my car like this. I felt like I was, and I, you know, boom, boom. I'm glad I was going 10, 12, 15 miles an hour. And so pretty soon you look around and there's all these cars all messed up. And it's like two in the morning. Well, I can't call Teresa. One, she doesn't have a car because we have one car. And number two, you know, I got three kids and they're small. And I don't know many people in this church. Who, who am I going to ask? And so I thought, well, who, who's the person? Are you ready? Think of you if this was you. Who's the person that you could call at 2.30 in the morning that would not get angry, right? And so I called a man named A.C. And I was meeting with him every, I think, Wednesday or Thursday morning. And we would uh, memorize some verses together and keep each other accountable. And my sense was that he really cared about me. But there's one thing to meet with a person, have a little Bible study, and be kind of casual friends. And I didn't have any family in town. And it's different to wake someone up at 2.30 in the morning and say, hey, excuse me, could you get up out of bed, drive about 40 miles, help me get a tow truck, and solve my life's problems? Well, I called him. And I could hear in his voice, you know, obviously with groggy. But he, was, he got up. He came, helped me get a tow truck. We drove back together. And that man actually became not only a mentor and a father figure for the last 30 years. Here's what I want you to see what Jesus was saying. Jesus was saying, um, you know, when I called him, I believed, I was shameless, I believed he would actually help me. Do you, do you see? I believed he was a good man. I believed he cared about me and would be so generous that I would not get, hey, you know, Chip, I'm glad you're the new pastor, but it's 2.30 in the morning. I hope you have someone who's a better friend than me. Um, good night. Chip will be back with some next steps to what you just heard. But before he is, if you found his message helpful, it might be good to tap fill in notes and use them while you listen again. This is a brand new series that came out of Chip's desire to share what he's learned about how life really works. He talks about our hopes, our insecurities, and our frustrations, all in the context of relationships and how God's word applies to building great relationships. Now, this may be a series you want to send to a friend. To do that, you can either share from this app or order the discounted CDs by tapping special offers. Well, Chip, You've got a specific application for today's message. But before you share that, tell us what's on your mind. I want to take just a moment to talk directly to those of you that are seeking a way to be more connected to the ministry of Living on the Edge. We're in need of partners who will take a step of faith and make a monthly financial commitment to the ministry. You may be thinking that because we reach millions of people through radio and broadcast and online and ministry resources that we probably don't need the money or that we're supported by all these people. The fact is, it's a very small percentage of all the people who listen or do small group resources that actually give to the ministry. We depend on and we deeply appreciate those partners who make the decision to walk with us, especially with a monthly commitment. It doesn't have to be a large amount. So let me ask you, would you please pray about becoming a monthly partner? Thanks so much in advance for whatever God leads you to do. If partnering with Living on the Edge is an idea that makes sense to you, we'd love to have you join us. Helping Christians live like Christians will change the world we live in. To give a gift, just tap the donate button on this app. Now here's Chip with his application. As we close today's program, I hope you picked up on the fact that we're talking about a faith relationship, an intimate relationship with God, not a formula. And we're going to talk a lot more about this in our next broadcast. But for today, Jesus was teaching his disciples, and he wants us to realize that our perception of who he is will determine how we respond to him. He says what prayer really is about is understanding the heart of the Father. It's about the how much more God. It's not a transaction. It's not some little game that you play of if you pray so long or say certain words, then these things happen. And what I would say to you in that little definition that I gave in the teaching of prayer is nothing more or nothing less than simply keeping company with God. But I would remind you it's keeping company with the how much more God and the application I would give you today is simply to bring your needs and your struggles and your hurts to him. 
I mean, forget all the if I do this or if I do that and just say, Lord, this is where I hurt. Lord, this is my pain. Lord, this is my frustration. It's interesting that when Hannah, it says she was pouring out her heart to God and the Lord heard her prayer. It was David when he came back and his family was gone and the raid had come and he just cried out to God in his desperation. God met him. What I want you to know is that the God of the Bible, the creator of all that there is, is personal and caring and longs to help you. And the way to connect with him is not some formula. It's to lay your heart bare, share what's really going on. And in our next broadcast, we're going to talk about how to experience the how much more God. Just before we wrap it up, have you ever been listening and thought to yourself, you know, Chip, I wish we were visiting over a cup of coffee because I'd love to ask you about, and I'm sure you can fill in the blank. Well, your opportunity's here. Friday, Chip's going to be in studio to answer your questions about relationships, what God has to say about how to build great relationships and how to build a healthy family in a modern world. So every Friday, we're pausing to give Chip a chance to answer your questions about relationships. To send your question, just email it to chip at livingontheedge.org. Until next time, this is Katie Kennard saying thanks for listening to this edition of Living on the Edge.